Welcome to all those joining us via the live stream. Great to have you in worship today. There's a lot going on right now that could occupy our time and our attention. Thank you for setting aside some time to celebrate who Jesus is. I think if we do a lot more of that right now in this season with all that's going on, it would absolutely put our focus right back where it needs to be, and that's on the risen Christ. Amen. Welcome home. Those two words were rich this morning because I was able to say those words to Jim and Don Brevere. Jim and Don have been a part of this faith family for so long, predated me, certainly. Uh, for a short season, they transitioned out, and God has transitioned them back in. And so they went through the new, me new uh, member orientation, completed that, and uh, saying, hey, we're ready to make a commitment to be members, faithful members of this faith family again. And so they are coming, uniting with us by promise of letter from Wade Baptist Church. So let's just give God a praise on that. Amen. <laughs> And when you pass them in the hallway, just say, Jim, Don, great to have you back in the faith family. We love you tremendously. Well, this month is all about our Lottie Moon Christmas offering in terms of our mission endeavors. And we thought it would be a little more personal to bring somebody to you that you might be familiar with. But you watch the video and see what you think about it. Marajo Church family, we are so excited to be able to just share with you just briefly about how we're doing and uh, give you an update and to encourage you to give to missions as you're entering this Christmas mm -hmm. season. Um, but we are doing well. Um, we hit the ground running as soon as we got here and it hasn't stopped since. Um, but we're kind of getting adjusted to everything. Uh, we feel like we're getting moved in, I feel, um, where we are. And we also have recently started our teen Bible studies. So we have a Bible study with the P6 kids, which is like sixth grade. And we have a Bible study with the secondary kids, which is like junior high and high school. Um, so we're excited to be able to start those as we've already, already been here. Um, yeah, and I'm sure Heather has an update as well. Yeah, so right now, due to COVID, things are definitely different than normal, as you know, most people use that language but um we some of the older kids have started back school uh, they started the beginning and the middle of november kind of in phases and so we have hopes um that all of our kids will be back in school by the beginning of january um we're excited for that we're excited for them to be back in the classroom we think that's the best way for them to learn but we have been working with them um with online school and tutoring and different things just to to keep them learning during this time so they don't forget what they've learned and um, just trying to engage with them so they aren't in their communities so sometimes in the community it's really bad influences all around so if we can keep them busy with a little bit of stuff um that also helps with them not being around bad influences or being swayed to do something just because they have idle hands. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we've been up to, and we just wanted to share that with you. And we just wanted you to know, you wanted you to know that we have heard your prayers, mm -hmm. and we thank you so much for your support. And keep the prayers and the support coming. Um, your work and it's not in vain, and we appreciate it so much. Um, truly, I don't, you don't know how much we appreciate it. Um, and it's even just the little things of being reminded about church. Um, about you that uh, makes us smile. Uh, but we wanted to share where you where we are. We're on our balcony of our house. <laughs> yes. So we have a great view, as you can see. Peeps the <laughs> water tower of the neighbor right there. Um, but in the papaya tree. Uh, but it's a great view, and we absolutely love our house. God definitely provided this for mm -hmm. us to be able to host the t Bible study and everything mm -hmm. else. Again, thank you for your prayers and support. And please remember to give to missions as you enter this Christmas season. Bye. It is Lottie Moon Christmas offering season, and you will see by the on the monitor that our church goal is thirty thousand dollars. So as Christ uh, uh, imparts upon you uh, to give, that you will consider our church goal in mind as a part of the national goal to reach uh, and to help hymns all across the world. Let's stand together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. So all across this room, we want to lift our voice in praise to him. Everyone singing. Here we go. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God. Of 
eloquence I could display and every language sing. A thousand words could never say the praise I have for thee. Oh, 
Father, we praise you in this place today, giving you all glory and honor. Father, to lay before you the cares of our heart. God, to come before you a broken people, whether we have faced sickness, death of a, uh, of a loved one, financial, whatever it may be, Father, we know that we can't do anything apart from you. So we bring it today. All those things that have seemed to weigh us down, God, we bring it today and lay it at your feet. God, we just want to praise you in the midst of the storm, whatever the storm of life is that you're living right now. So, Father, Father, as we come to you, would you just pour out a blessing upon us as we bless your name today. Father, thank you for your grace and your love. Father, for your grace that is new each and every day and your mercy. God, as we call upon your name, we know you hear us. So, Father, we wait in anticipation of how you're going to move in and through us today, this week, days to come. So, Father, bless our singing. May it honor you. Bless our prayers. Bless the preaching of your word today. And it would honor you first and foremost because this is why we gather corporate worship. It's for you. So be blessed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please be seated I want to say welcome to you on campus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us via live stream. Pray that you will be blessed today. Sing along with us. Let us know that you're watching. You can um, send your prayer request to fbcbankleave.org. Let us know that you are watching us today. Well, we just want to claim Jesus. He is the image of an invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. So let's just continue to worship him right now in this place. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. He is the first, the last, the one who matters most. He is creator, he's ruling sustainer of all. He holds it all together. He is the word of God the hope for all the world. His name is lifted higher. Jesus, your 
Son of God, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Lord of the Universe, Light of the World, Jesus, Name above all. to love the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life hey, isn't it encouraging to know that the penetrating truths of that verse continue to bring hope to the hopeless to shine light into dark situations ultimately to remove fears and anxieties and it's only right, because as we look back to that night, we're told that the message came to a group of shepherds who were out in the dark Judean you know, uh, countryside. They were watching sheep, and in the midst of the darkness, light penetrated, the glory of God revealed, and those words rung out, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Why? Because I bring you good news, great joy. And the good news was about someone, some, someone so unique, someone so different than anything they could have ever imagined. That someone was none other than Jesus, a Savior, Christ the Lord. And that then compelled them into a journey. You know, friends, as we prepare for the celebration of Christmas, I want to spend some time over the next few weeks being recaptured by this simple statement, He is and I want us to be reminded of exactly who Jesus is because I'm afraid either through man-made traditions or either through just the, the whole melee of life, I think we've forgotten who Jesus is to a point. I think we've forgotten who he is in terms of creator God. 
I think we've forgotten who he is as God himself coming to us in what we call that beautiful, unimaginable, miraculous uh, time of unveiling the glory of God for us. And so this morning, I want us to look at what is arguably one of the most profound Christological texts in all of our scriptures, Colossians 1. And here we find Paul presenting to us through something of a hymn, the strong truths about who Jesus is and how that's been demonstrated through what he's done and how that then should dynamically affect our lives. And so what we're going to do this morning in something of a worship experience at home, please join us in this, obviously, is we're going to do a responsive reading on this. I've divided it up in the, the uh, verses that most scholars believe it would have been uh, incorporated into a worship hymn in the, uh, you know, in, in the antiquity church. And so I've got it to where I think it should be obvious. I've got Brent's going to read. I've got my verse. Then I've got Faith Family read. That'll be where you'll be reading. And then I'll move the slides as we get through the verses on the whole. So let's praise through the responsive reading of God's word together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All right, home, you got ahead of us a little bit right there, so stay with us here now, okay? He is before all things. He is also the head of the body, the church. Wow, isn't that beautiful? For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. Amen, may it forever be. Who do the people say that I am? The identity has always been crucial. It was a question that Jesus presented to his disciples nearing the end of his ministry. And it wasn't a question so much for information in terms of Jesus kind of doing a survey just to see based on what they're hearing from the crowds, who the people say that I am. No, no, no. He's the omnipotent God. He's the omniscient God. He knew the answer. No, no, no. His question wasn't for information His question was for confirmation. And he got it, did he not? Through the mouth of Peter, no less, who just one verse after this declared that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he knew that confirmation would have to be, it had to stick because eventually it would cost them their life. As the authorities would challenge them, they had to be firmly established on the fact of who Jesus is. You are the Christ. Well, then we fast forward about 30 years or so, depending on what date you go with, and and we see that in the region of Colossae that there's an error teaching, there's a false teaching going around concerning, guess what, who Jesus is. Have you ever noticed that Satan is consistent in that attack? He knows what doctrinal truth is crucial to attack. And the error was basically this. Jesus is not the creator God. Jesus is the creation of God. He is a higher emanation of that creation, but yet he has created No less. And so Paul in chapter 2 says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deceit, all that based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. And the issue was simple. Who is Jesus? Well, fast forward about 2,000 years or so, and guess what? The debate still rages, and the question is still being asked. Who is Jesus? Scott Jatani, I've quoted him several times for you because I like him. I think he's very straightforward in what he says. He answers from a biblical perspective, and he doesn't back down. He's a speaker, author, you name it, he's occupied that position. Well, in 2011, now granted, we're a little bit from that, but in 2011, he wrote the book With. Got some interesting titles in there, by the way, or subtitles in there, by the way, but in the book, he cites a good friend of his, Scott McKnight. Now, Scott is a professor, I think it's Northern Theological Seminary right now, I can't remember exactly where he's at, but he's a professor at a seminary, and so one of the things Scott would do with his incoming students, not necessarily freshmen, but all new students to him, is he would give them a test with 48 questions on it. 
24 questions would, re, would kind of relate to who do you think Jesus is? Questions like, uh, is Jesus moody? Uh, is Jesus the nervous type? Uh, is Jesus a party animal? Or is he more of an introvert? Questions like that that deal with personality. And then what he would do is he would subtly change those questions in the next 24, the next set. Instead of focusing on Jesus, they would now focus on the individual, the student. But the question would almost be the exact same question worded differently. Now, Jatani talks about how it wasn't just Scott who did it. He knows several folks in Bible colleges who would do the same thing, present the same little quiz, same 48 questions. And what's amazing is every single one of them came back to a same conclusion and result, and result of how the students answered who Jesus is in relation to who they are. And it was astonishing because Dr. McKnight said everyone thinks that Jesus is like them. Everyone thinks Jesus is like them. The test results also suggest that even though we like to think we're becoming more like Jesus, the reverse is probably more the case. We try to make Jesus more like ourselves. And so the error was raging in Colossae. Paul, understanding that if he didn't get a handle on this, if he didn't bring clarity and understanding to this in terms of who Jesus is, then the church would eventually die and be destroyed because that was heresy. And so in verse 15, he just goes right to it, does he not? He is. He is. And look at that statement. He is the image of the invisible God. That word image is, is a fascinating word. Econ is the Greek. Icon is how it comes to us. And so you're familiar already because we know icons. We know them well. It's the idea of a likeness or an image as translated in this CSB. But the beauty of that Greek word is it can take us on two avenues that eventually converge together. It can take us in the avenue of representation. That idea of a statue or something that's been impressed upon a coin and that's not really outside of the biblical purview either. That's right in line with biblical truth. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. And so the writer of Hebrews takes it a step further. He uses the word character, which is not talking about the result of what's put the image in. It's talking about the origin of the image. It's saying, hey, he's the stamp. He's the engraving tool. And so when we think about who Jesus is, he is the representation of the invisible God. But like I told you, the word representation is a beautiful word. Two ideas converging together. And so not only does it mean representation, it also means manifestation, which brings a level of richness to the idea of the revelation of who Jesus is. It's the idea of being a visible expression. We see it. Touch it, experience it. Certainly that's what John had to be talking about in John 1.18, right? No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. The word revealed there is the word we get our English word exegesis from. It means he executed him. He, 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 he explained him in a way that we could then grasp and understand and see, comprehend to the great degree that our minds can comprehend. And then, of course, who could forget John 14, right? Here Jesus is, the upper room. He's preparing his disciples for his departure. And in the process thereof, he talks about going away and preparing a place. And Thomas jumps right in there. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How on earth can we know the way? And then John 14, 6, we all know it well, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Philip couldn't stand it. Philip looked at him and said, Lord, you show us the Father and that will be enough for us. John 14, 9. Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time and you don't know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Philip. Think back to all the miracles. Remember, Philip, when the great crowd was before us and all we could find was a couple of fish and some bread and I multiplied it miraculously and fed 5,000 plus. Philip, remember that time we were in the boat, the, the waves were raging, the winds were blowing, the storm was howling and y'all were scared to death and all I had to do, Philip, was say, peace, be still and immediately nature responded obedient to me. Philip, 
Don't forget all the times that we would come encounter encounter demonic, you know, demon possessed people. And remember, they wouldn't listen to you guys. They wouldn't even obey your command. But the moment I commanded them, they immediately came out of that individual and did exactly what I told them to do. Philip. Think about the message itself and how when the people heard me teach, Philip, they looked at me with awe and wonder because I taught them as someone who had authority. Philip, surely you know who I am. I am God as man. He is the revelation, the representation, the manifestation of the very God. Wow. And as such, he is preeminent. He is preeminent. He's the very presence of God. He is preeminent. Now, I'll tell you, verse 15, well, I got ahead of myself here. First of all, thinking back to what Paul says in verse 19, if you kept going, he would say, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That word all is important. That's the reason why I've got it bracketed for Paul in this hymn. You know why I know that? Because he uses it five times. In every case, he is demonstrating that Christ in his fullness is the all of that everything. He is the fullness of God. All fullness dwells. He is the creator of all things. All in every capacity. Exhausted. And then chapter 2, verse 9. The entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Oh, the celebration of John 1, 14, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now hear me out. I don't have a problem with nativity scenes. I don't have a problem with Christmas productions, pageants, plays. I don't have a problem with that. My problem is, though, is that we have narrowed down the celebration of Christmas to a feed trough and a baby, when the fact of the matter is, our celebration should be focused toward the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, because on Christmas, we are celebrating the fact that He is, came to dwell among us, the full and complete revelation of God, all fullness dwelling in Him. That is what we celebrate. That should cause praise. That should cause praise. And Paul said, hey, man, not only is he God revealed, he is the preeminent one of all creation. Now, this text has caused a lot of misguided theology, a lot of heresy. In fact, heresy was already going as a result of that particular word, prototokos. There was some, a man by the name of Arius, who came along in that time period, and, and he began to teach that Jesus was not, in fact, God made man. He was a creation of God, not the creator God. He was a higher emanation of that, but yet he was still not God. And so when Paul used the word prototokos, it should bring clarity instead of confusion. Let me explain why. The word's used eight times in Scripture, find it eight times in the New Testament. Out of all eight, only one time does it refer to the idea of being firstborn in chronological sequence. And you know what's so fascinating about that? The only time it does that is in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Guess who's being talked about in Luke chapter 2, verse 7? It's when Mary took her firstborn, Protokos' son, wrapped him in tightly in cloth, and laid him in a manger. That is accurate to the context of that particular text because that was Mary's firstborn son, according to the prophecy. But every other reference to Protokos comes to us in the idea of priority, preeminence, position of rank. Why would that even matter to us? Well, look at what one writer says. It means priority to all creation, and I love this, sovereignty over all creation. I think we're kind of struggling with the idea that we're losing control of this thing, aren't we? Oh, yeah, getting a vaccine's helped. I get it. But we still feel like the world's gotten out of control, do we not? There's still political turmoil. There's still financial uncertainty amidst the pandemic of all things, and then not to mention that the pot was kind of already full of a lot of other stresses and anxieties and worries. And guess what, church? We're not immune to it. In fact, I think we've succumbed to it. We've allowed ourselves to be sucked into the worrisome attitude that is less than desirable and honorable to God. Less than. Christ is preeminent and sovereign over all creation. He has not lost control. He is still working out his plan perfectly, beautifully, powerfully, and one day he'll confirm it when he breaks the skies and calls his own to himself. He is the preeminent over all creation. Wow. And so as such, it puts him in the position to be creator. 
Man, this is powerful. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things, there that word is again, have been created, here it is, through him. Man, can't you hear the prologue to John's gospel resonating in the ears? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. The word was in the beginning God. All things, listen, all things were created through him. That's the exact same statement that Paul made. Wow, coincidence? I don't think so. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Think about that, friends. The implications of that statement, the implications of that truth, they are very narrow. I'm telling you, sliver narrow. But the applications of that truth are gigantic. Please allow me a few moments to explain. Hang with me here. Because I want to just show you the magnitude of verse 16 in personal experience as best I can. And I want to start with the enormous, almost inconceivable, and I want to bring it down to a very personal level. First of all, and I've used this quote before, I've used this reference before, but several years ago, astronomers decided they wanted to take the Hubble telescope. And they wanted to focus on a part of the sky that, it, just, it was dark, it was black, it didn't seem like there was anything there to the naked eye. And so they turned the telescope in that direction, and, and I'm sure it doesn't do that. I'm sure it's not a Polaroid thing. I'm not, but took a picture. And one of the astronomers on that particular project said, basically what we covered was the equivalent of you putting a speck of sand on the end of your finger and extending it out as far as you can. And whatever is blocked by that speck of sand, that's about the area of the universe we covered with that picture. So keep that in mind. So what did they see? According to this astronomer, they saw 10,000 galaxies in that one picture. I didn't say stars. I didn't say planets. I said galaxies. And so they just took the ratios and the formulas, put them into equation, and were able to conclude that our universe probably consists of 100 billion galaxies. We live in a galaxy. We're a speck in it. I mean a speck. And within that 100 billion, and in every single one of those 100 billion galaxies, guess what? They estimate there's probably 100 billion stars, which if you put all that together means that total, there's something like 10,000 million, million, million stars. I can't write that many zeros. I can't think in that terms of quantification there. It's huge. But luckily, Dr. Edwards could. He said that means that there are more stars in the invisible universe than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. Wow. All things were created through him. Not done yet. Let's bring it back to the immensity, the vastness of it in terms of light. One writer says this. In terms of light, it takes the sunlight traveling at 186,000 miles per second. That's smoking, man. That's moving. 186,000 miles per second, about eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. But listen to this. That same light, same speed would take more than four years to get to the closest star, Alpha Centauri, which is roughly 24 trillion miles from our planet. Only politicians can say trillion. The rest of us common people barely say billion. 24 trillion miles. And then there's the size of the stars. Think about our sun. Our sun is 864,000 miles in diameter. That's 100 times our earth. In fact, you can take 1.3 million earths, 1.3 million now, of our planets and fit them inside the sun. What? That's ginormous. And yet astronomers tell us that there's these things called red giants. One of them, they call it Betelgeuse. I'm telling you, that's the name. I YouTube it. They call it Betelgeuse. And by estimates, Betelgeuse has a diameter of 100 million miles. Let me put that in perspective for you. That's the orbit of Jupiter around the sun, 100 million miles. That's the size of one star. 
By him, all things were created through and on. Gosh, what power. And yet, in the midst of all that power, there was a careful attention to precision. Listen to this. If this doesn't blow you away, I don't know what will. One of the most astonishing discoveries of astrophysicists have, have made in recent decades is that if gravity were just one trillionth, now listen, we're not on the left side of the dot, we're on the right side of the dot over there. If gravity were just one trillionth of one percent stronger, our universe would have reversed course long ago, it would have collapsed catastrophically, ending in a big crunch. One trillionth of a percent, folks. And likewise, he says, if gravity were just one trillionth of a percent weaker, our universe would have flown apart so rapidly that planets and stars and galaxies, basically all the constituents of the universe, would have never had a chance to coalesce. We'd all be dust in the wind. One trillionth of a percent. All things were created. Through him. Wow. And then we think about the diversity in creation. I'm just going to reference one aspect of it. Marine life. Several years ago, a group of oceanographers got together, or whatever they call them, said marine biologists, whatever, and they wanted to study the oceans to try to exhaust the species that are present there. And so they spent 10 years scouring the planet. All sources of aquamarine life trying to discern or trying to exhaust all the species. And they did find 6,000 new species. And they added that to the collection and discovered that we have 250,000 different marine species on our planet. 250,000! And one quickly chimed in and said, hey, oh, and by the way, we still have about 20% of, of the ocean volumes that we haven't been able to explore. It's either too deep in terms of the human, we just can't get there. It's too remote, we can't access it. But there's 20% of our ocean life that we have yet to discover, and they believe it's there. And it is diverse. Some of the names they were describing, some of you may know them better than me. Some of the, the creatures they were describing, it was so almost, uh, you know, um, I said Martian-esque kind of. Oh, the diversity in God's creation. Through him, all things are created that have been created. And if that doesn't get you, I sure hope this does. Because we're about to get very, very personal. Several years ago, a group of scientists conducted what they called the Human Brain Project. They decided they were going to use technology and an understanding of the brain to create an artificial brain, a supercomputer, if you will. Well, news leaked out that they were going to be doing this, and immediate response came in. They were getting rebuked, ridiculed, made fun of, because there were others in the same field who understood that just the sheer magnitude of the human brain. And they just began to point out a few things that were going to be very, very, very almost impossible to mimic. First of all, Scientists argue that you can't possibly reckon, replicate the connectivity of the 100 to 500 trillion, the T, there it is again, synapses of an adult brain. 100 to 500 trillion. Now, a synapsis, as best I can understand it, is like a junction point. There, there's two transmitters that don't quite come together. There's almost like a little bit sliver of a millimeter of space and yet electrical impulses, chemical impulses are going back and forth across this all day, every day, 24 hours a day, transforming information at a rapid light speed to the tune of 500 trillion synapses. The scientist said you'll never duplicate that, never. The second thing was this. They pointed out that the human brain is not, it's not stagnant. It's always growing. It's not static. It's always growing. Now, there does reach a point at which the physical aspect of the brain ceases to grow because our skull no longer expands, but yet the brain and the cognitive function and the, and the collection of information, it never stops growing. It's always expanding. And so these scientists said you will never be able to match that. Never. But what really sealed it for me on this one was when the head scientist of the project, Dr. Markram, confessed. The human brain, he says, the human brain is a million times more powerful 
than even the most powerful supercomputer that exists today. Now, that was back in 2012. We've made advances. Still can't touch it. The human brain is also vastly more efficient. Now, here, listen to this. If completed, the energy required to run an artificial brain, the supercomputer, would equal the megawatts needed to run an entire small town in the middle of winter. Now, not Van Cleve, because it don't get cold. We're talking about somewhere up north where it's cold, it's dark, you need heat, you need lights. The, desire, the demand is high. That's the level of energy and power that this supercomputer would need. And yet, he says, the incredibly complex brains hum along at the equivalent of a mere 20 watts of energy. Put that in perspective, he says, that's the amount of energy you would need to run one little bitty light bulb. <sighs> Through him, everything that was, is created that has been created. Friends, he is Lord. He is God revealed to us, manifested in power and purpose. He is preeminent in his creation. He is the all-powerful, we say omnipotent God. He is Lord, and we must worship him. We must. That's what compels us. It makes me think about the response I read once of Francis Collins. Francis Collins, one of the main leaders on the Human Genome Project, where they tried to decipher the whole DNA code. And when they got done with it, Collins, not necessarily an avid Christian, but not an atheist either, one who had a background in religion, when they were done with it, all he could do was praise. He launched into a praise song. How great is our God. That was a scientist who sang that in response to what he saw. May we in this season be gripped with a sense of praise and awe and wonder because he is the revelation of God himself. He is preeminent in all aspects of creation. Priority number one, and he is the creator of all things. For by him and through him were all things created. Why? For him. They were created for him. That's why. What do you mean, Brent? Well, Paul, in a separate letter, explained why. Why for him. It comes to us in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For his invisible attributes, that is, his, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. So as a result, people without excuse. A universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies. Stars beyond number. A galaxy, the expanse of which our minds cannot comprehend. A precision that goes beyond the trillionth of a one percent. The diversity of just one part of an ecosystem that is so complex that anything can throw the whole thing off. And yet a beauty of something like the human brain. According to Scripture, that is what is a general revelation of both the power and of the knowledge and wisdom of God. And what should that, what should that revelation have prompted? It should have prompted praise. It should have prompted worship. It should have prompted submission and surrender. But there was a problem, wasn't there? Because the prize of creation, that's us, man, the prize of creation decided to latch on to the creation instead of the creator. And that's what Paul says. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Yeah, we sure did delight in the creation. And we sure did deny the creator. And probably the place where it shows up the most is when we looked in the mirror one day. And they didn't have mirrors in the garden, but they probably had still water or something like that. But when we looked in the mirror one day and we decided that we could be God better than God could be God. And that whereas God had said don't do, we were going to do those things. And whereas God had said do, we didn't really want to do those things. We would become God. 
And according to Romans 121, that compelled us into utter darkness. Sin's the word that we use. A captivity so powerful that outside of an equal or more powerful force, it would never be broken. It would never be broken. You may be here today and you may be in that captivity. You may be watching at home and you listen to me describe the immensity of creation, the delicacy of creation, and the diversity of creation, and you're saying, wow, surely there had to be a designer. I'm telling you what, there wasn't just a designer, there was the designer. And according to my Bible, my condition of sin, I could do nothing with. But he absolutely penetrated the darkness. Look back at verse 13. Look at it. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness. Wow. You know what that says? That says that he is entered into the condition of his fallen creation. He stepped right into it by his own purpose and initiative, not compelled by me one bit. And when he came into it, the creation acknowledged him, everybody except man. And yet for those who did acknowledge him through confession and surrender, you know what the Bible says? To them he gave the right to become children of God. Wow. And so if you think today your condition is utter darkness and helplessness, you are bad wrong. Because my Bible tells me he rescued us from that domain, that power, that authority. He rescued you. And how do we come about that rescue? How do we then accept and receive and begin to experience that rescue? I go back to Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Whew, amen indeed. Thank God for that, John. There you go. Amen. That in that moment in time, Emmanuel, God with us, he is stepped in to provide a revelation and manifestation of the greatness of God. He is the one preeminent over his creation. He is who spoke it all into existence in the first place, came into the melee and the madness and the muck and the misery of his creation, and he brought hope. If you don't know that hope, you can today. You can too. You can too. How? Confession. Belief. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Praise be to God. He calls us to faith. He calls us to faith. So the second question about this, and let me, let me say this. If you need clarity on that, for those of you at home, if you need clarity on that, there are people online right now that would be happy to guide you biblically through that. More than happy. For those here right now, as soon as we're done, I would be happy to walk you through what the scriptures say regarding our condition and our Lord's response. It's a beautiful response. It is a deplorable condition. But the Bible makes it clear. Do you allow me that opportunity, please? Would you all allow us that opportunity at home, please? And then what about us believers? If we tre- I've heard amen, so obviously we believe this. What is the conviction about who he is? How is that going to affect us? Well, let me ask you a question. How did it affect the first group that heard the message and then went and saw it? You remember? Because we're told that once the shepherds went and viewed the babe, that they went back to their campsite, they got their chairs, and they really began to kind of work through their feelings. One guy took the lead, and he began, Bob, tell me how you felt when you saw the manger. Uh, Matthew, can you, can you please explain your feelings about it? They, went, they, they talked about their feelings, Right? Mercy, no. No, their feelings couldn't be further from the, I mean, the feelings were affected. I'm not saying that. But it says they returned glorifying and praising God. They were overwhelmed by the greatness and the goodness of God. In other words, they were compelled into worship. Now, I'm going to tell you what. That song today, Be Exalted, it got me. I'd already heard it twice. But for some reason, when we were singing it this time around, I started crying back there. Because I was just sitting there, your name be exalted. I'm thinking, yes, yes. And I'm saying, maybe the people of God stand and exalt. And then I looked, I peeked around, and you had stood up. 
And we were singing in unison. It was getting louder. And I was saying, listen to the praise of your people, Father. They are declaring what you alone are worthy to receive. That's what we must do, my friends. When we come to the true, heartfelt realization of who Jesus is, he is the invisible God manifested in his fullest revelation. He is preeminent in all of creation, over it in authority and power. He is the creator of everything that's been created, and he is the redeemer of it all. And that should compel us to worship. It makes me think about that great little... Little chorus. Crown him King of Kings. Crown him Lord of Lords. Wonderful Counselor. Almighty God. Emmanuel. God is with us. And he shall reign. He shall reign. He shall reign forevermore. He is the invisible God manifested. He is preeminent over all creation. He is the powerful creator God who created everything that has been and ever will be created. And he is the redeemer of our sin-savaged souls. He is. For that reason, we should praise him. And the second thing is this. We should declare his greatness. We should delight in and we should declare his greatness. Last week I forgot about our verses. I got so caught up in the vision sermon it just it escaped me. So luckily some of you saw it in your email, your, your weekly newsletter you're getting by email. If you're not getting that, please call the office. We can get you into that. But here are our verses for this week. And I do love it when you share. I do love it when you give some, uh, some, some overflow of your own personal worship in that share. I love that. It's so personal. But remember... Our goal is, first of all, that these beautiful truths would be a prompting to worship in our hearts first, that the transformation that is to be experienced starts with us first. So each day this week, you get into that word. It's just one or two verses a day, I believe. You get into that word. More importantly, you get that word into you, and you just see how right there in Hebrews and in Ephesians, the apostle gives us that glorious truth of who Jesus is. And you know what I pray it does? I pray it compels you to worship. Then when we come back together next Sunday, what we bring is the overflow of what we know and have experienced. That is, he is God revealed to us, Emmanuel. He is preeminent in all his creation. He is the creator of everything that has ever been created. And he is the one and only redeemer of our souls. For that, we give him praise. Amen? Amen. All right, a few announcements. First of all, I, want, I just want to say thank you to our senior adults for not letting, well, we always done it that way, hold us back from what we might could do. You know, they recognize that being Christmas and it's just something about certain foods that in the South convey Christmas, just like at Thanksgiving, you know. And, and so what we want to do is, is have a Christmas luncheon, but have it in a Chick-fil-A style. So some of us are going to be standing outside the uh, PMPR back there with, with iPads. And, and so when you pull up, you say, hey, welcome to, Chick welcome to First Baptist Church. How may I serve you? And then we'll get, no, I'm just kidding. The, the menu set, by the way, we ain't set, we ain't, we're not mixing up plates here. We're going to fix the plates of what we have. But what we need is to make sure we fix enough plates and not too many plates. So you're going to have to call and reserve. I think Tuesday's the deadline on that. So make sure to get in contact with us by Tuesday for our seniors and a celebration of Christmas together. Secondly, we've already talked about this, but I just want to reiterate, Lottie Moon is your chance to make a global impact. Your efforts and your investment financially will somehow, some way, change a life across the planet. That's a promise. I'm telling you. It happens all the time. So give, pray, give sacrificially as God leads you. Our goal is $30,000. That's, that's crazy, Brent. I agree. That's why we want God to give us that goal. We want God to lead us to that goal, and he's going to do it by, impro by um, compelling you to give. Number three, keep praying about small groups. Keep praying about where God would have you to land in community with others. We want everybody connected to small group, connected to life-changing truth, connected to life-changing uh, community, and connected to life-changing ministry. It is so vitally important in a time when we've been separated out 
relationally that we as the church get back together relationally. And it can't happen in the large. It's got to happen in the small group. And so please pray about that. Commit. And then, hey, we'd be glad to direct you and guide you in that. And then lastly, we have committed across the year to pray for our school. And man, do they need it. Some of the teachers are, you know, exalted. They're like, man, praise God, the 18th is coming. The 18th is coming. That's their break. And many of the parents are going, oh, Lord, the 18th is coming. The 18th is coming. Yeah. So let's pray for our teachers, our administrators, our principals, our, all those, and especially our students. COVID has made a difficult situation more difficult. Um, but praise be to God, they're persevering. So let's pray for them, please. Would you stand as we do that? So Holy Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we come. First of all, we just celebrate who you are. Oh, gracious, overwhelmed by two short verses, two powerful verses presenting undeniably powerful truths that you are, Lord Jesus, sovereign God, that you are preeminent in your creation, you are priority, number one in priority overall, that you are the power of creation. You spoke it. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we would see your glory. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that although we think back to a feeding trough with a baby, that in reality what we're celebrating is an empty tomb. We're celebrating the initiation of a process of salvation whereby you dwelt among us, teaching us your truth, showing us our inadequacies because you fulfilled the law perfectly. And we couldn't even begin to touch it, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And yet you allowed yourself to be murdered by your own creation. Wrongfully, innocent you were and are, perfect in your existence. And yet, whereas death had held man captive since the fall, death could not hold Jesus. Because on the third day, the tomb was empty. You are alive. And you hold the keys, death and haze. So, Holy Father and Lord Jesus, we come celebrating you today. We lift up our schools to you, administrators, teachers, students, everybody and anybody that's associated with that process of education, just asking for a little extra perseverance to finish well. God, give our students recall to take their tests. Give our teachers the, the careful preparation to get them to where they're ready to take that test and and God, ultimately, may your purpose be realized, not just in the education itself, but in the doors that that opens up. The possibilities of realizing why I'm even here are opened up through that. Lord, we love you. We do praise you because you alone are worthy of our praises. And forgive us for ever directing the praises that you deserve to anyone or anything else. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Love you, folks. See you when we can. You're dismissed.